Well, thanks for staying with us on the program this Friday morning. And now to our broader topic of discussion as we look to find tactical solution to the cases pertaining to Nigeria's insecurity situation. We're joined by a security expert and a consultant, Ambassador Nuhu Isa, uh, Nua Isa, rather, who joins us virtually. Hello, Ambassador. Good morning to you. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. We can hear you. Thanks for joining Thank us on the program me. this Friday. Let's get straight into it. To begin with, the situation in Niger State, where 12 persons were killed following alleged involvement of foreigners in illegal mining activities who are now being said to fund banditry. A, a few of those incidences across the northern part of the country have been largely linked to issues of illegal mining. How does Nigeria begin this quest to find tactical solutions to the issues peculiar to this region. Please, I didn't get that. Can you recap? Can you come again? I said, owing to the reported incidences of those who have lost their lives following the involvement of foreigners in illegal mining activities in Niger State, how does Nigeria begin its quest to find tactical solutions to ending banditry related to illegal mining in the northern part of the country? Okay, okay, I got it now. All right, well, um, uh, globally, this is not uh, the first time we are having such situation regarding um, mining of um, mineral resources in our beloved country. And um, looking at it from a very critical angle, we all know the state of the country at the moment, and um, the, the factors that, that must have led to illegal mining in those communities and in those areas. Uh, in as much as we have those factors, we have insecurity that are also attached to it, and uh, we have a lot of interest in all these areas. But um, there are a whole lot that needs to be looked into this morning regarding illegal mining. And um, I would say government has a role to play. The host community leaders have a role to play. The civil society also have a role to play, and um, looking at it, looking at it holistically, um, it's time to take action. It's time to take action, and the right time to take action is now. So, and um, government need to look at how we can protect our resources and use our resources for the benefit of Nigerians. If that is considered, never mind. It will cop. It will cop the situation to a very larger extent. Because the illegal miners might feel, from an analytical part point of view, they feel they are not um, carried along, and they feel they are not participating in in what um, what the government is really doing in their community, and they are not um, beneficiaries of the resources in their host community. So um, that will trigger that can be a factor that has triggered anything illegal mining. I believe that has answered that particular question. Now, whilst you've looked at it from a call to action, listing the critical key stakeholders from the government to individuals, it has also been based on how licenses to mine are obtained, the expiration of such licenses and how transferable they are. The government has been largely accused of lacking data on the said miners who are foreigners and how they can easily access uh, border countries from border countries into states with these minerals. How can Nigeria best take actions to strengthen regulations in line with obtaining licenses and the transfer of these licenses without the knowledge of the government of the day? That's a very good one. First of all, um, we need to look at our laws, our mining laws. If those laws are standardized, then we need to look at how we can implement those laws. And then we need to look at the other part of um, corruption, because um, some of these illegal miners uh, that are foreigners, they, they find their way to get the attention of people in government, and they, they, they bribe them. They engage in corrupt practices to get all this um, mining license that's been given to them without following due um, process. And uh, this is also affecting our mining industry. We all know what is happening in, in Nigeria at the moment. And um, 
everybody is just out there to fish for himself. So the international communities who are coming in to mine our resources, majority of them don't even have license. And some of them who have license, they got their license through the back door. You understand what I mean? So these are some of the factors that are that is affecting the mining industry. Looking at the way forward, government needs to look at the policies that has that has been there existing and how we can how they can harmonize how they can harmonize this policy to suit in what's really going on in the mining industry. That will go a long way in covering the illegal mining situation we are having in the country, which cut across not just only Nanga, but also in even in Abuja here. There are also illegal mining activities taking place in Abuja, Zamfara, in other parts of the country. Cut across, it's not just only in um, Niger State that they are having uh, illegal mining activities. I've been to Niger State. I've been to some of those sites where they are carrying out these illegal mining activities. And a uh, few years ago, that was 2019, I was in Niger State. And um, I took a tour around and I discovered that those communities that have these mining resources, they, they, they are suffering. They, you know, abject poverty is one of the factors that is triggering the locals to engage in illegal mining activities. And when the locals are into all these illegal mining activities, the international um, 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 operators, we, not, we have no choice than coming in and manipulate those locals in getting their way to, to access those mineral resources without even the federal government um, notice. So these are some of the characters that are attached to the area that is affecting the mining industry and it's not a good record for the country as we speak. Now, as we look to set the background for this conversation and hope to get it right in finding tactical solutions to the manifestations of insecurity that are peculiar to the different regions in the country, we've started with the north. Now, coming down from the north into the middle belt of Nigeria, some of the manifestations of insecurity as a resultant of uh, as a result of the clashes between heathers and farmers. Now, we've seen issues of cattle rustling, issues of land grabbing that have left several thousands of Nigerians displaced for their community. Now, the current administration has looked at it from the angle of the necessity of a ministry of livestock. Would you say that this is one of the tactical solutions that has been provided that can actively address these issues of insecurity in the middle belts? Um, from my point of view, I will say no to that because um, I am from the Northwest, I'm from Kaduna State, and uh, I, I grew up in the North before I moved to Lagos, and currently I'm in Abuja. And um, from my experience, I have toured around the, the, ge the geopolitical zones of this country, uh, passed across um, that particular region, Benue, precisely and i will tell you i will tell you um what is happening today is not new it's not new at all and um from my point of view i think um it all boils down to those basics those basic um amenities those basic things that government needs to have done for its people uh, we cannot put all the responsibility on government, but it's very important that government um, come into the situation because in every state, government play a major role to the peace of its people. And uh, in as much as we have um, challenges in illegal migrants coming into Nigeria without some levels of proper documentation and scrutiny, we must um, make sure that, that our government are up to um, up to their responsibilities in all these areas to make sure that they, they cope the menace. Um, rattling of um, talking about uh, cartoons, rearing, and um, other local uh, traditional uh, activities that goes on in all these community, you discover that uh, they are having their criticalities and complexities at different levels. Some of these people that are into all this cattle rearing, some of them are not from Nigeria. They are not from Nigeria, but 
um, due to the movement of their breeding, they happen to find themselves in Nigerian borders, and before you know it, they get into the communities. And when they get into the communities, they don't know how these people are living in the communities, and before you know, and they don't know the um, tradition of those communities, and they, there must be a clash. There must be a clash, because the Benue state I know of is not a, a, a Fulani state, for example. It's not a state that is dominated by the Fulanis. So if we are having clash between the Fulanis and the Benue uh, Bendelite, the Benue uh, indigenous, it's, 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 it's called for because um, they practice different tradition. And when you investigate, if our uh, law enforcement security agencies carry out investigation, you discover that these guys, they are not from this locality and they are even foreigners. And it is what it is. And um, the clashes keep on going years before now because there is no level of understanding between all these parties. So there must be a response, there must be a way that government should respond to the locals. There must be a way that the local government, chairman, the, ruler, the um, traditional rulers can also come into this situation and see on how they can collaborate with government to enable them to tackle all these insecurities in their community because from the grassroots level, the um, traditional rulers has a role to play to protect their community. And the community dwellers also have a role to play in protecting their community by sharing of information. If you see a strange face or a strange activity in your community, you have to report to your uh, community head. Your community has to report to the local government. The local government has to report to the necessary authority to make sure that there are need for law enforcement. So, and um, talking about law enforcement, a lot of challenges. We're having a lot of challenges when it comes to law enforcement in Nigeria. So, um, they have to harmonize. They have to look at how they can implement um, efficient law enforcement strategies to protect our borders, especially in the Middle Belt, in the North, and all those areas, to make sure that they cope insecurity and uh, illegal movement of uh, persons moving with uh, animals from one village to another. We don't have, uh, we are less of uh, forest rangers in Nigeria. We don't have a platform whereby we can engage with the forest rangers whereby they can protect our forestry. Our forest is loose, our forest is not protected in the whole of Nigeria. We, in as much as the government is doing a whole lot, the security agencies are doing a whole lot, but there has to be a deliberate plan and a, de and a deliberate uh, action need to be need to be looked into on how we can protect our our forestry to a very larger extent. Nigeria, as as a state, has um, a youths in in host communities where they they can be they can be trained to protect their community. They can be trained to protect their community and capacity building. They have to build the capacity of host community to make sure that they they protect their community to protect the integrity of Nigeria to a larger extent. I think if that is considered to go a long way in covering insecurity in the Middle Belt. Now, now, still staying with issues of insecurity in the Middle Belt, particularly from the angle of a tradition which you referred to earlier on as you look to make your point, in terms of the nomadic nature of those involved in cattle rearing. The legislative arm of government has also been looked at as one needing to prefer solutions in terms of anti-open grazing laws. Now, there have been different opinions on to as to how achievable it is to achieve a ranching system in Nigeria. Do you think that if states move to adopt the domestication of this anti-grazing law, particularly in the north and the middle belt regions of the country, it can also help to address this situation? Um, it all depends. I will say it all depends because I, I grew up in the north. Let me use my experience to respond to this question. I grew up in the north and... In Kaduna, where I grew up, I grew up having the Fulani friends. And the, the Fulani 
friends I had then in the early 90s are different from the Fulani I'm seeing today. So how different? I must say that uh, we need to look at um, the 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 in, the persons, the individuals we are talking about here. Time has changed. A lot of things. Technology has changed. The season has also changed. But implementing such a law, we have to consult various parties. Our government has to make a critical consultation before implementing such law. I think it's very important because um, in the north, I am from Kaduna South, and in Kaduna South, we farm a lot, unlike those in the Kaduna North. So if you look at it, those in the Kaduna North want to have all these um, animals, and these animals must feed. And if these animals must feed, they must take them to the bush. And in taking them to the bush, before you know, they trespass and enter. Let me not use the word trespass, but they find themselves in Kaduna South, where we have a lot of farmers, we have a lot of farm um, land, and they want to come in. And before you know, they are eating grasses from grasses, they are into your farm. So it's a call for the government to make critical consultation before implementing such law because um, in other developed countries we they have um way they 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 organize their 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 cattle their animals they don't just release their animals to go to the bush and they just feed on the grasses they just feed on the leaves they have rules and regulation that must be um considered and i think implementing such laws which our government should be able to weigh it to, to make a balance now do you think that this so role of implementation and regulation area. should be an active function of the ministry of livestock as created by president abola metinibu yes i think um um such ministry has a vital role to play in these areas and um, if the ministry are following up our conversation right now, I think it's a high call for the ministry to to engage with stakeholders. It's very important to engage with key stakeholders, especially in the north where a lot of farming activities is ongoing. Engage with key stakeholders. There can be a workshop, a seminar, a conference. Let there be a way of harmonizing how they can establish whatever laws that is related to to cattle rearing and their settlement in the north. It's very, very important because majorly in the north, we farm a lot in the north, and uh, the farmers are facing a lot of challenges, and cattle, they don't want to start dealing with more challenges that has to do with cattle coming to come and eat their farm um, produce. So in all the, in all of this, it will lead to may escalate to something else that is unplanned for. No, so I think the, the ministry should the, the ministry should um, come up with uh, a vibrant um, implementation plan to see how they can get the attention of various stakeholders in the north to engage with them personally to engage with them and to see how they can come up with a level of and jurisdiction in order to protect the interest of everyone in those areas. Now, staying with the case study of Kaduna states, like you raised earlier in your comments, talking about Kaduna North and Kaduna South, one of the manifestations of insecurity in that state has also been tied to cultural and religious differences. You mentioned the cultural differences in terms of the agrarian nature of those in the South versus the cattle rearing nature of those in the North. But when it comes to issues of religious differences that have often manifested into some of the clashes that we find out, how do you think that the Kaduna state government moving forward can engender a harmonious relationship between persons of different religion in Kaduna state? I, I will still recall and I will go back to my primary school days and... Um... When I was in the primary school, now Children's School Kaduna, that's the Nigerian Air Force Children's School Kaduna in Kao, it's 
a community where we both have the Muslims and the Christians, and in the military barracks, because I'm from a military background, in the military barracks, then as a child, as a military child, I I could recite, I could recite the Muslim prayers. I'm a Christian, but I could recite the Muslim prayers even while they are praying, and they also could recite the Christian prayers, the Lord's prayer, while we are praying. So we all pray together. At the early 90s, I recall that we all pray together, and there was no this form of religion crisis. I would say misconception or um, misinformation has really um, caused a lot of damages in Kaduna State because um, uh, lack of information has affected a lot of people. I would not say it has affected the Muslims or the Christians, but we are all humans and we are born into a Christian family or a Muslim family. So that's the first thing. We should look at it from that angle, that we are all humans. I was born into a Christian family, and my friends are also born into a Muslim family. So that should be very, very, that should be a point that should be important to us. We should, we should not look at religion as something that will cause a division in, in any way, not only in Cardona State, but in Nigeria at large. Because, um, I, from if I should say I want to look at this critically, I would say, well, um, some ignorant religious leaders, or I, was, I may say some wicked religious leaders have misled their followers. And if the head is, is bad, what do you expect from the follower? What do you expect the head to pass across? What button do you expect the head to pass across to his or her follower. So these are the challenges we have in Kaduna State. The Muslims or the Christians, in one way or the other, has been misled, has been um, um, misinformed. That is the and they act based on the information they receive. So a follower can tell his a, a leader can tell his follower that okay. Um, if you are in the market and you engage with all these um, Christian brothers and they do this, you don't do this with them. You separate yourself, segregate yourself. You only do this with your fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. For example, for example, there are a lot of levels of segregation in Cardinal State between the Muslims and the Christians. And why is why why is that so? It's so because the Muslim brothers and sisters have been misinformed in so many ways. And the misinformation that has been given to them, they use those information to relate with the fellow Christians. And when they relate to the fellow Christians in that way, there won't be a balance for both parties to work together. So th that has generated to a lot of insecurity in the country. Before you know, it has led to so many clashes, that has led to so many riots. And I would say from late 90s, um, a lot of, I was able to experience a lot of uh, Sharia riots in Kaduna State, which occur mostly every Friday. And all these riots are due to lack of understanding between both religions, both the Christians and the Muslims. But um, of recently, I think um, education has also played a leading role because uh, exposure, as I said, what is the global village now? exposure is also playing a leading role they are getting to read they are getting to study they are getting to go to school especially the the muslim communities in the north they are they are becoming very versatile and they are getting to know what is what they are getting to know what is what and they are beginning to challenge the status quo as you can see let me use the recent um and bad government protest as an example in jaws you can see where the muslims and the christians they prayed together. In fact, the Christians were surrounding the Muslims, protecting them for them to have a successful prayer session before they continue the protest. So that's just a good example of what I what I experienced as a child while I was growing up. It was not so from the beginning. It wasn't like that from the beginning. But what later happened? So it's like a uh, a competition between Christians and Muslims, and 
all of a sudden, it has become what it has become. And there is insecurity in the state. And even in governance, even in governance, it affects um, the citizens of Nigerians. If a Muslim is there, we, everybody will say uh, it's our brother that is there. The Muslim to say it's our, it's our, it's our, it's our, Namune, it's our brother that is there. If a Christian is there, they'll say, now it's our turn. So leadership should not be like that. A state should not be like that. Uh, a country should not operate in that uh, format. So a country cannot develop in that kind of atmosphere. A state cannot develop in that kind of atmosphere. Kaduna State has not um, benefited from this insecurity. Kaduna State has, it has not done Kaduna State any good in all this religious crisis. It has caused more, more harm than good. I would say that really caused more harm than good. I have records of some governors that has a good mindset for the people, and they came in. They were Muslims, and they performed very well. I have record of some governors that came that were that were, were Christians. They came in, and they had a good mindset. For Ambassador people, Noah, and Noah and talking about records of governors. They, they, they are best for, the former for governor the and the Nasser Erufai has been one governor who, on record, many have accused of making statements that constitute to inflammatory or inciting comments against religions. Amongst these records you say you have, what's the record of uh, former Governor Naso Erufai in this perspective? Well, I, I think I was privileged to be in the, to visit the state government house a few years ago, and when I visited, he was not on seat. It was his deputy that was on seat. And, um, I I went on a different engagement particularly, but from what I could see, I I say well, Erufai was somebody that also employed Christians in his regime. So I I, I will not draw a conclusion to say he was um, how will I work? how will I put it? I will not draw a conclusion to say he he was sentimental in a way, or he was that religious in a way, because I, I had a series of conversations with my fellow Christians who, in Kaduna State, who were telling me that, well, uh, we have so so person who is working under Aerofire, we have other persons who is working under Aerofire. I'm not in the right position to say some certain things regarding how he worked in his um, tenure, but from the look of things, I visited Kaduna subsequent times I saw some levels of development, precisely, especially in the north, northern part of Kaduna. I saw in the metropolitan city, I saw some levels of work that he was um, doing, and which is quite impressive. But uh, regarding the religion um, um, crisis, I, I, I may not dive into it because I was not constantly present in Kaduna and only come for a visit and leave. Oh, all right, so very quickly, I, I, let, let's I, leave the north. I have little so words to say on that. All right, very quickly, let's leave the north, the middle belt, and look at some issues peculiar to the south, south, southwestern part of the country. In that region, some of the manifestations of insecurity have been tied to the rich oil deposits of the Niger Delta. Some have manifested outrightly in the theft of crude oil, some others have evolved into kidnapping and some others outright armed robbery. Now, in tackling some things people say is the aggravation of those who feel deprived of the natural resources domiciled in their regions, how does the government find solutions to ending some of the manifestations of insecurity owing to the prominence of these deposits in the South, South, Southwest region? Well, I... Um... I will say, um, as I said, that um, what the insecurity we are facing right now in Nigeria at various levels, um, there is nothing that is happening that has not happened before. In the sense that, okay, looking at the South-South region, the Niger Delta region, a lot of insecurity is in that region. And this insecurity did not just emanated in that region without a cause. And in all the six geopolitical zones of Nigeria, there is no insecurity we are experiencing today in Nigeria that just started happening today without uh, a factor that must have triggered it to, 
to be what it is. The Niger Delta region, we all know that. We all know the importance of that region in Nigeria economy. There, the region play a very vital role in Nigeria economy when it comes to crude oil resources. And um, you discover that over the decades, injustice and marginalization has stayed for a very long time. So the weight of kidnapping in that region is overwhelming. Because when kidnapping started from the Niger Delta area, it has to do with all those um, insecurity, rather. When the insecurity started, I think, um, was from, from my notice, started from 2006, where um, kidnapping of uh, expatriates who are working for other companies became rapid. And they kidnapped this expatriate to get money from them or to make a request for financial resources. And who are those engaging in all these kidnapping uh, activities? We discovered that they are community dwellers. Because these expatriates are coming in to work in their community. And from the look of things, is as if we are not benefiting from our community, yeah. and you, the foreigner, is benefiting from our community. So we don't know what to do, and we are suffering. We're in abject poverty. We are under pain. So our, our cry is not being heard. So what we can do, we kidnap you to get the attention of maybe the oil company or whosoever that is um, responsible to pay us on ransom, then we release. So it becomes a business. So the situation got de more deteriorated at that uh, level. And it has affected the state, it has affected the integrity of the region at various stages. But no expatriate wants to come to Niger Delta today without providing adequate security. So these are some of the challenges. Corruption is there, injustice is there, marginalization is there, joblessness is there. The youth are talented in so many ways. They have strength, but their strength is not being channeled into the right direction. And poor government policies in all those states, in all those local local communities has also affected them. Looking at the oil spillage, oil spillage has been in Nigeria Delta for so many years till date and this oil spillage we are talking about has affected the marine lives the fisheries that these people are feeding on this fish they feed on they also sell this fish to gain a living from it this fish also give them protein so you can imagine the damages that have been done in all these communities we are all humans. How do you expect the community's dwellers to respond? Okay, if they are not responding, what has government put in place for these communities? So these are factors that should be looked into. And the last time I checked the Niger Delta region, I discovered that there are a whole lot of security formations and agencies dominating the Niger Delta region. But we don't have humanitarian response um, platforms that are giving them food, that are giving them education, that are giving them medical uh, facilities, that are checking on them and making sure that these people have rights to basic, um, basic amenities. So these are some of those critical factors. And if you look at it, the way the government has responded to the region from an international perspective, it's not been fair because they also have rights. The Niger Delta dwellers also have rights to live. They have rights to a good life. And to be very honest with you, I have interacted with a few of the Niger Deltas who hail from communities where there are resources. They are not well to do. They are suffering. Even in this Abuja, they have Niger Delta citizens who have left those communities because some of them can no longer stay in their community. They have to relocate. 
because the oil spillage has spoiled even the atmosphere in that community. It's not a good place for any living thing to survive. It's not a place for any living thing to survive. So these are the factors that have affected the South-South region and indeed it's causing a whole lot of insecurity because some of the host community um, dwellers has engaged in all manner of criminal uh, activities which has led to um, oil bunkery and all those and other forms of insecurity. We well, we, we must thank the ambassador Nuaisa. Time is fast spent. We appreciate your effective review of the situation and some of the suggestions that you have preferred. We appreciate you for agreeing to come on the program. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me.